came uh, forth with the translation that they came forth with, and the Textus Receptus. They these men you have to understand this morning. These men were not like us. They didn't hold it in their hands and say, "This is without a doubt the Word of God." No, they doubted. As a matter of fact, they would make statements for the bill like, I'm not sure that God's Word is infallible. Yeah. As a matter of fact, one of them would say that anyone who is intelligent, if they read the first part of the book of Genesis and the creation account, know that it could not be a literal description of what happened. Because they couldn't understand it with their mind. Amen? So they would begin to read writings like Darwin, his books, his theory, yeah. and they would be fascinated yeah. at the evolution theory. And they would say they find it hard not to believe. Now, I'm talking about the people who all modern day versions are based on their textual criticism. Even if some of them, even if some of the, the people of today that have to do with the NIV and the Good News for Modern Man and the Message Bible and all the others, even if they distance themselves and say, well, you know, we, we, we don't go by what Westcott and Hort. Listen, Westcott and Hort polluted the waters to a point to where they'll never be clear again. All right. Amen. That's right. They started a landfall that cannot be stopped. From 1851, listen, for 200 years, from 1611 till 1851, there was one Bible that was considered to be the Word of God. Right. That was the King James Version. Amen. Someone said in some writings I was reading, you could read any version you wanted to for those 200 years as long as it was King James Version. <laughs> Amen. Right. Until these two men decided that some papers that were found, some transcripts, some writings, yeah. that dated before the copies of the Textus Receptus that was used by the King James Version translators, they decided that older must mean better. Older must mean more accurate. Right. So they began to weave their spell of false doctrine by translating from the corrupt Greek text a new Greek New text, uh, Testament into the English language. And the revision committee got together there in the mid-1800s and they were going to update the Bible, you know, and fix it. Westcott and Hort, these two men, and I, I guarantee you, if you do any study on yeah. modern day versions, you will come up with two names more often than any other. Westcott and Hort. Westcott and Hort. Oh, these, oh, they were learned men. But boy, they were so confused. Hmm. They didn't know what they believed. Yeah. Amen? Come on. Listen. Westcott was a firm believer in Mary worship. And Hort claimed that Mary worship had a lot in common with Jesus' worship. Hort believed in keeping Roman Catholic sacraments. I'm talking about the men that had to do with your NIV that you packed this morning. Amen? I'm talking about the men that had something to do you cannot shake off. Listen, the dead hands of these two men rest upon every version of the Bible that we have in the United States of America other than the King James Version. Every version that was that was came out in a revised version after 1851, every one of them had the dead handprints of Westcott and Hort on them because they left an impression, they left a corrupt Greek text that would never be done away with but is still being relied upon today mm. to translate new versions. Wow. <clears throat> Listen, Hort believed in baptismal regeneration as taught by the Catholic Church. Yeah. He rejected the infallibility of Scripture. I posted something this past week on the internet, needless to say. It wasn't as popular as I'd hoped it would be. For the bill, you might have seen it. I put on there that we're looking for churches and Christians interested in sitting under the teaching of a couple of very intelligent men. Scholars. Teachers. Then I begin to share with them what these two men believed. They do not believe in creation as recorded in the book of Genesis and cannot understand how anyone intelligent could, under, could believe that. They do not believe that God's Word is completely true. One of them would like to recommend how great the beer was at the last hotel he stayed in. You can find those those are found in their own letters, in their own handwriting, not something because they're something their enemies have made up. They believe in purgatory. So don't worry about it. After this life, you can still get right even if you was lost whenever you died. Mm. What about the devil? Uh -huh. 
Well, neither one of them really thinks he exists. Got any takers out there yet? Anybody wants to book these fellas for revival? Got any pastors out there that think they might want to book? Oh, I'll give you a quote from one of them. Evangelicals that you seem to me more perverted than deceived. And I asked any pastors out there want to hope you want to get these men and have men for revival. Mm -hmm. Any Christians out there interested in sitting under their teaching, letting them guide you and lead you into what God's Word has to say? I'm assuming that I didn't have any takers because no one responded. They're just saying, hey, let me book them guys at my church. Amen? Right. I'm assuming I don't have any takers. Anybody that wanted to sit under their teaching yet today, if you hold in your hands any version other than the King James Version, you're being influenced by the work of these men. Though they have been dead and gone for a long time, their work is carried on. Amen? We know today that the King James Version translators were all devout men of faith. We know today that the two men that influenced the revision committee in 1851 were far from godly men. Didn't even know what they believed. Wasn't sure there was a heaven. One of them said the only heaven that we'll ever have is in our mind. These two men are the most influential men that have influenced every modern day version since 1851. And we can talk about all of that. And we can talk about today, some people think that there's a conspiracy between men, you know, that, well, let's, do, let's corrupt the Word of God. I believe there's a conspiracy today. But I don't really think, I believe that down through the years, there have been many people who their intentions were good. Yeah. They didn't intend to corrupt God's Word. All they intended was to make it, you know, well, let's make it easier for people to understand. You know, we can understand that. Yeah. We, can, we can abide that. You know, well, that's, that sounds like a good idea. But when you see and you begin to look at the 60,000 changes, did you hear what I said this morning, Brother Bill? Six, not six. 60,000 changes. 60,000. When you look at the Greek text, the text that Westcott and Hort used and they thought was more superior than the text that the King James translators used, and you realize that it contradicts itself 3,000 times in the Gospels alone, you begin to shake your head and think, wait a minute, something ain't right here. Amen? Yeah. 60,000, you didn't have to make it that plain. Amen? Come on. They didn't just, the, the intent of the one that is behind all of this, his intent was not that Brother Tyler understand the Word better. His intent was to corrupt the Word of God. His intent was the same as it has always been from the beginning in the Garden of Eden when he curled himself around a tree and he talked to Adam and Eve. Amen. His intent was to corrupt the seed of the Word of God. Amen. His intent. See, if you can correct the seed, bad seed don't have the same result. Amen. Listen. Listen, I want to read you something. Open your Bible. Mark 4th chapter, the third verse. Mark 4 and 3. We could talk all day about the beliefs of Westcott and Hort. Go to the library and get you a book. Look up Brooks Foss Westcott and Fenton John Anthony Hort. And you'll be able to find out what these men believed and the influence they had on every modern day version of the Bible that you can lay your hands on yeah. except the King James Version. Even the New King James Version is influenced by these men. Mark 4 and 3 says, Hearken, behold, there went out a sower to sow. And it came to pass as he sowed, some fell by the wayside, and the fowls of the air came and devoured it up. And some fell on stony ground where it had not much earth and immediately it sprang up because it had no depth of earth. Yeah. But when the sun was up, it was scorched and because it had no root, it withered away. And some fell among the thorns and the thorns grew up and choked it. Yeah. And it yielded no fruit. Right. And other fell on good ground and did yield fruit and sprang up and increased and brought forth some thirty, some sixty, and some an hundred. And he said unto them, He that hath ears to hear, let him hear. Now drop down to verse 14. He begins to explain to them what this parable means. Verse 14, Mark the fourth chapter. The sower soweth the word. Yeah. Did you hear that? Amen. That lets me know today that the word of God is likened unto seed. Yes, Brother Bill. Right. The sower went forth to sow. Amen. Amen. And he began to sow the good seed of the Word of God. Right. 
And it says, And these are they by the wayside where the word is sown. And when they have heard, listen to this next statement, Satan cometh immediately and taketh away the word that was sown in their hearts. All right. Now we don't have much trouble understanding today exactly what that means. That means that God planted some word in Brother Tyler's heart and immediately the enemy decided to come and try to take that away. He decided to come and try to steal that. Brother David, he decided to come and try and take it. Amen. I submit to you today an even sinister crime, an even sinister plot right. by the enemy. Come on. If he can change the seed before it's ever planted. Mm -hmm. Come on now. Yeah. Stay with me. Right. If he can corrupt the seed, Brother Sleese, yeah. if he can change the word of if he can change the word of God. Ah, oh, say, Brother Billy, prove to me that he's done that. Oh, I wish, I, I was glad you asked. Amen. <laughs> I'm glad you asked that. Praise Go with me. Or you don't have to if you don't want to, but I'll read it to you. Genesis 3 and 1. This is Genesis, the third chapter. And this is the conversation between Eve and the serpent. And he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said, mm -hmm. Ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden. Yeah. Now you can find some of the words that God used there, but when you read it like that and you read it the way God said it, it's got two different meanings. Right. We find him in the Garden of Eden, Brother Bill, all the way back then corrupting the words of God. The fifth verse the fourth and fifth verse says, And the serpent said unto the woman, mm. Ye shall not surely die. Mm. What did God told him? He told him you die. die. Ye shall not surely die, for God doth know mm. that in the day ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened, and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. Yeah. So we find Satan all the way back to the, in the beginning, the Garden of Eden, the beginning for us, not the beginning for him. Yeah. Back in the beginning there in the Garden of Eden, He is twisting and corrupting. Right. And I submit to you today that the good seed is not all that's being sown in the hearts of man. That's right. That the enemy is wise enough to know yep. if I can contaminate or corrupt the seed, I can mess with the fruit. Mm -hmm. Amen. <laughs> corrupt seed. Don't bring forth the same results. Come on, man. Oh. That's right. Don't tell me. Don't tell me he ain't smart to a certain degree. Amen. Listen to this, Matthew 13 and 24. Another parable put he forth unto them, saying, The kingdom of heaven is likened to a man who sowed good seed in his field. Yeah. Matthew 13 and 24 is where I'm at. I'll wait for you to get there because I want you to see these next four words. Matthew 13 and 24. It says this first book of the New Testament. It says, Another parable put he forth unto them, saying, The kingdom of heaven is likened to a man which sowed good seed in his field. But while men slept... Yeah. Write that down, Brother Bill. That would be a good title for a sermon. But while men slept... His enemy came and sowed tares among the wheat All right. and went his way. Yeah. All he had to do is use these two men, Westcott and Hort. Mm -hmm. 